All right, welcome everybody. Uh, show of hands, how many people here know who Ayn Rand is? Oh, great. Well, you're gonna have a good time. How many uh, of you have read her novels? Anthem, the short one. Atlas Shrugged, Doorstop. <clears throat> how many of you have listened to a talk about Ayn Rand? Okay, will you all likely listen to a philosopher, but not a redneck philosopher? <laughs> so today is your lucky day. Hopefully this is not only enlightening, but funny, which is more important. So I'll note here that anyone can be a redneck philosopher. It uh, doesn't pay very well, and it's better if you're from Alabama. But being a redneck philosopher is about a state of mind, not a state. The first axiom of a redneck is that you gotta have redneck balls. Uh, which is, doesn't have to be real balls. They can be figurative, so we'll call them nerve and gumption. <clears throat> when you have an idea, something crazy, but something you want to do that you believe in, nerve and gumption tell you to do it when everybody else says not to. So, for example, you're 21 years old. You leave home, the only place you knew place where you grew up, and you move to another country that you've never been to before and whose language you have only had a few semesters in school to understand. I got the cell phone, I got Google Translate, I got my, Air I got my Airbnb, Starbucks is everywhere, I'm fine. Except it's 1926, there's no cell phone, no credit card, no Google, no Airbnb, no job lined up. And your country is a communist dictatorship putting people like you on the fast train to Siberia. So you can't go back. And what are you going to do when you get there? Don't worry, Mom. I'm going to be a writer. <laughs> and never mind that my accent is so thick that it could be a doorstop. The question isn't who's going to let me, it's who's going to stop me. That's what Ayn Rand did. And maybe you consider yourself a Ludwig von Mises man because human action's longer than Atlas Shrugged and harder to read. <laughs> Therefore, better. Maybe you prefer a Hayek. You're more of a middle of the road to serfdom kind of girl. Or maybe you like Rothbard because he has those retro glasses before it was cool. I like one of those guys myself. <clears throat> but none of them had the balls to do what Ayn Rand did, nor did any of them face the hatred and cond condemnation that she did for doing it. And so if you have terrible taste and find yourself saying things like, yeah, but she was a bad writer, you must admit she had nerve and gumption. I didn't always identify as a redneck philosopher. In fact, I came to actively dislike them. Partly that was due to my flawed understanding of Ayn Rand, because rednecks are dumb and lazy. And they don't appear at first glance to care about ideas, nor do they enjoy hearing about highfalutin plans whiz kid city boys come up with to come in and entirely remake society. Maybe like me, you read Ayn Rand and thought, I care about ideas, so I'm important. I don't know what they are yet. Buddy, I got some plans to remake society too. And I'm going to go to New York City, where everybody has those cares about ideas, and boy, they got plans also. To hell with these Alabama rednecks. So I went to college where I studied philosophy and creative writing, and verily did I meet those aforementioned whiz kids city boys, who I found to my great astonishment did not give one damn about ideas either. <laughs> and they certainly had no plans, unless it was, yeah, I don't know what I want to do. I think in law school. I said to my creative writing mentor in what I imagined could have been Rand herself talking, I am a genius and these people are terrible. They don't care about anything and they write about nothing. I can't even talk to them. At which point he told me something that I imagine the novelist Ayn Rand might have said to me. Every single person in the world is an individual human being with hopes, dreams, and desires. Contained within each is something special and particular. As a writer, it is your job to find it and to bring it out in them. And if you can or won't do that, quit. 
A redneck is an individualist. Live and let live. Don't tread on me. In my youthful arrogance, I had become an argumentative, judgmental libertarian asshole. I needed to be disabused of that. And the notion that Ayn Rand wrote her philosophy and then derived her novels from it, like mathematical equations, as propaganda to manipulate the masses into a libertarian paradise. What she actually did was write her novels with her imagination, sourcing her lived experience, her deepest held values and beliefs, the people she met, and the people she imagined she'd like to meet. That's the only way to write anything worth reading. A redneck is a maverick, and as a corollary, admires other mavericks. Not only did Ayn Rand write about mavericks, she was one. In 1935, when American intellectuals, the press, and the politicians practically glowed in the dark with their admiration for communism, she wrote We the Living, a novel about three young people in communist Russia uh, whose lives were made tragic by a system that destroyed their hopes and left them no pathway to exist as human beings. Her next novel, Fountainhead, was about an architect, which just sells itself. It was rejected by 11 publishers how many of you have done something and been rejected 11 times and went back for number 12? Oh, cool, you'll have to tell me what that was. Better not be a girl. <laughs> <coughs> In 1956, she published Atlas Shrugged, which features a woman executive of a railroad who took names, kicked ass, and in her free time had some pretty awesome sex with guys she wasn't married to. <laughs> to us, that's passe. But to Betty Draper and Mad Men, oh, so I can do what Don does? True to redneck form, Ayn Rand was successful in spite of the naysayers. People love her work. There are a lot of writers who lift their work-covered noses at Ayn Rand, who haven't sold as many copies of her, all their books as she did one of hers. What does it tell you when somebody loves something? You could say it's a demonstration of their lack of taste in class. This is called blaming the audience. You know how many film directors get a bigger budget for their next film after they release a stinker that the audience just didn't appreciate because they lack class and taste? Zero. If you don't blame the audience and instead treat them as human beings with emotional and spiritual needs, and you think a little bit deeper, investigate why they like this, then you might uncover some truth about the human condition and yourself. People love Ayn Rand's novels because A, they have an actual plot, which wasn't and still isn't in vogue in Little Roy Fauntleroy's Salons of High Literature in Williamsburg and Echo Park. B, they have themes and values that connect to actual people's real lives. Anyone ever try to get you to give in, do something that would compromise your integrity? They did to Howard Rourke. Anyone ever try to diminish your accomplishment? even take credit for it. Well, they did to Hank Reardon. Have you ever felt despair, fury at the system, and rage at the power brokers in Washington, D.C., who think of you not as an individual, but as someone meant to pay and obey? And have you ever felt that despair, in that despair, that nothing could be done no matter how hard you tried? And then, did you let it all go, and in friends, and family, and yourself, find hope. Dagny Taggart did. Ayn Rand's novels are about the values and ideals that undergird every decision that we make in life. Some writers want you to look down, Rand wants you to look up. Readers of Ayn Rand, whoops, readers of Ayn Rand understand this, it's why they turn the pages and it's why they care about what happens in the end. Rednecks make grandiose claims about themselves and their own amazingness. Ayn Rand, check. <laughs> I think it was justified. Ayn Rand is the single most important person in generating and bringing the ideas of liberty to the public. And if you want to understand those ideas and where we are today, you must read her. For those of you who think this might be nonsense, and you prefer an economist, I'd suggest you do some math. Not hard math, just counting. Books sold, movies watched, social media mentions. I know you can do it. We've been doing math in libertarian circles for years, hoping someone would look at our work and say, yeah, 
You know, that makes sense. I'm going to vote for Ron Paul. <laughs> <clears throat> Rednecks, of all the minorities and groups, remain the one that everybody can still make fun of in this woke world, still hate. Still lay upon the shoulders all the woes of humanity. If someone hates rednecks, they probably hate Ayn Rand. You might think because Ayn Rand is hated, you should hate her too. Jump on the Twitter wagon, score some points, get some followers, be a winner. To be hated is unpleasant, but not necessarily a bad thing. Depends on why you're hated. If you're an annoying, argumentative libertarian, as I once was, that's a bad reason to be hated because you don't have to be that way. But what if you're hated for doing what you love, for not blindly following the crowd when it comes to decisions about your own life and for saying things that some people don't want others to hear? These are good reasons to be hated. When I thought about Ayn Rand as a young man, I thought about her as a queen in a crystal palace with armies on all sides, howling like Bodacia, defend me. And a philosopher under attack? Sign me up, buddy. <laughs> then I met a group of objectivist analytical philosophers. And then another group of objectivist analytical philosophers who disagreed with 1% of the ideas that the other group had, and so were kicked out. And then all the libertarian groups of all strains and stripes who felt the moral imperative to divide their scant forces into yet further warring tribes, valiantly swearing never to ally with about 100% agreement on everything. At first I thought, damn, I gotta pick a side. Then I recalled Ayn Rand's first and only commandment, think for yourself. One way to look at the ideas of liberty is a conceptual rationalist system, a crystal palace, if you will, and the Denzians of this palace are very concerned about minor differences in every atom of the palace for fear that will crack. Disagreements will threaten its very structure. This is a way to think about liberty, but it's not the only way. The other way to possess liber is to possess liberty as wisdom, to feel it, to own it as a means of crafting your own life into an art form as every particular and special human being deserves to. This way requires no sides. You find meaning for yourself, you take it and carve out your own unique lived experience and hopefully create a life that you enjoy, since you only get one, and that gives inspiration, love, and hope to others. Now, rednecks like country music. So do I. Which, of course, is also shat upon in Little Lord Fauntleroy's salons from Williamsburg to Echo Park. I don't think Ayn Rand liked country music, though she didn't have me to introduce it to her. So who knows? What I do know is I find the, some of the sentiment and ideas in Ayn Rand's novels reflected in the great works of country music, such as Johnny Paycheck's Take This Job and Shove It. Maybe John Galt was listening to that <laughs> right before he started his strike. And Atlas Shrugged, all the creators head west to the mountains, not unlike a bunch of redneck preppers. And that Galt's Galt scene reminded me of another Hank, Hank Williams Jr., Country Boys Can Survive. Hank Jr. describes the kind of person that can brew his own whiskey and his own smoke, too. He can skin a buck and run a trot line. Country boys can survive. Hank might have added, he can invent his own engine and his own steel, too. Ain't too many things them old boys can't do. <laughs> when I think of Dagny Tiger getting a flat tire, I don't imagine her calling AAA. She gets out and that damn thing herself. Much like Gretchen Wilson's redneck woman, Dagny had class but she didn't seem to think too much of high-class broads, like Lillian Reardon. You don't have to think about Ayn Rand the way anyone else tells you that you have to. The goal of my talk here today, other than to be amusing, <coughs> was to give you like another perspective on Liberty's, story, or Liberty's storyteller in chief. Not everyone who reads Tolkien dresses up like an elf and LARPs on the weekends. Perhaps if more people looked at Rand the way they do Tolkien, we'd have a lot more liberty in this world and fewer elves. Perhaps you find some inspiration in this view that releases you to create, much as I found a release for my own imagination and became a film work, filmmaker, and I work with many libertarian and objectivist groups today uh, getting to do that. 
We need more people creating stories like she did. Maybe you can be one of them. Questions? Um, well, I usually approach it from the standpoint of the emotions, values, beliefs, and characters, and then the ideas kind of organically go in there as themes, thematically. So I sort of look at it as if a rationalist means of thinking is so with your axioms and it's, you know, governed and connected by logic and observation in a, in a creative work. It's, it starts with some thematic deep truth about humanity and is connected through a character and to a plot that makes story logic. So it's analogous but different. Anybody else? It's just, you're just too riveted by what I said. Yes? I think of Ayn, Ayn Rand's atheism as a contradiction, I guess, how people usually think of rednecks as being religious, right? So just thought about it. Yeah, well, I think, uh, you know, when I was uh, young, I, I, like, I, I read her arguments and to my mother's chagrin agreed, you know, especially since my mom had suggested that I read Anthem in the first place and write the essay for the scholarship at the Ayn Rand Institute, so she was ultimately responsible. Uh, <clears throat> I kind of feel like God and is a, in, in Ayn Rand's context as she used it and disproved it, uh, I still agree with, but I think God and Rand herself said, said this, I think, in an interview. You know, it's one of those words, it's, it's a piece of our language that often has more meaning for people that is not necessarily associated with Zeus crashing down upon us with lightning. And in some ways kind of is, it's a means of referring to the whole. And so when I read, uh, you know, any philosophy or ancient philosophy or writers who, you know, talk about God in that way, I sort of, I sort of think about it that way. That's how I connect to how their feeling, and it's not something that I feel that needs to be proved or disproved if it's that. You know, it's something that sort of is your sense of the whole. Okay, yes? Other than cowboys and aliens, if Rand had to write something today, what do you think she would start? Ayn Rand would uh, be a YouTube star, <laughs> uh, the greatest at rants and sick burns. She'd so probably have a <laughs> Brad Twitter. I think. Uh, I don't know, it's an interesting question today, like uh, what should we be making? You know, she wrote novels back in the day that was in vogue, you know, that was the means by which you communicated the ideas. Um, you know, I've made feature films, I've made shorts, I've done narrative, I've done animation. Uh, I think that it's, imp when you're an artist, you are in dialogue with the, uh, the audience, and so Part of what you do has to be something they want uh, to consume. And so it doesn't mean that you can't have the attitude of, well, this is my thing and I have creative integrity to it and I'm not gonna change it. I'll just go work in the quarry. Maybe find a hot woman on a horse to come by. Give me some water. No, uh, I, I think like, um, I think she would have likely been in that space and probably been amazing at it because she seemed to be someone who's very in touch with the audience. One thing I th always found is, you know, when people talk about Ayn Rand, for some reason it is boring as hell often, and she was very keen on controversy. So there is the rape in Fountainhead. There is Dagny, the VP woman, doing what she wants and flipping the union narrative in the middle of, you know, uh, right, at, right ahead of the 1960s. Uh, these are not decisions that were necessary to produce a philosophical truth. They were decisions that she knew would get that thing going in the audience when they heard about it and they have to then, you know, read it. Uh, I think that's... Uh, that's instinctual and it's talent and it's, you know, uh, it's something we need to do a better job of. We're communicating these ideas. Yes? Do you think documentary filmmaking is more persuasive than fiction? I guess it depends in the context of a, 
of what we're, how we're, well, what's our mechanism of persuading? So if I'm, if I'm a sort of mind that prefers uh, you know, logical thinking and evidence and data, then I think a documentary can be a great way, pending how you do it, to, to visually convey that. I sort of feel like an essay is better. Um, if the persuasion is, I want you to suspend your disbelief and put yourself in the shoes of a character that's totally not like you and go on a journey and when they reach a, a, a point of understanding of a thematic truth, you internally reach it with them. Can you then go and reverse describe the derivation of how you got there philosophically? No, but you don't need to because you sort of already feel it and know it because you feel like you lived it. And so I kind of think when we're right there along with Dagny, uh, you know, which would, which would be is a narrative, uh, we sort of discover the sanction of the victim and the thematic core with her. And so I think that's the kind of thing it buries itself deeper and becomes a part of your identity. Whereas seeing something often in, in documentary form that's more data driven as out there. And it maybe convinces you in your mind, but not your heart. And, uh, and I, I think ideally it should do both. And the way we go about pursuing documentary is, is in a narrative context, not, not the, the logical structure. Um, I, <clears throat> I kind of feel like you don't have to. I mean, I've never run into a scenario when, where I've kind of sacrificed. I mean, think about it this way. When you're a storyteller and you're at a campfire, there's a bunch of people there at the campfire, and uh, you're trying to scare them and get, you know, get them to laugh. And if they were invisible, you know, you would just, if I try to give a talk and there's none of you they hear, uh, you know, I'd be dying up here. <laughs> you know, I don't know whether it's working or not. And so you, you want it to work and you want it to be read. You don't write the novel for yourself so that you can read it in your own room. Uh, you write it to be read. And you, so to me, like when I'm a filmmaker and I'm writing a script or I'm writing a novel, I am purposefully trying to set up the audience to get a moment uh, by design. I want them to laugh and then also see how terrible the situation is at the same time and go on the journey with the character uh, to, to understand that, that thematic truth. So I never really uh, feel like you're dumbing it down uh, to make it funny. Uh, in fact, if it's not funny, it's probably dumb. <laughs> Other thoughts? We're, we're going to wrap out if you guys don't have anything. Yes? Last question. Um, similarly to, to what you asked in regards to the, like the redneck uh, Christian values and so on, what do you think in terms of the also prevalent uh, approach to like, you know, like hosting people and being very open and like uh, providing to, towards others that are, for example, are guesting at your home and so on? versus the sort of anti-altruism stances that uh, Ayn Rand is, is professing. Yeah, well, um, so kind of the whole idea of me uh, doing this at all and using the redneck as a metaphor motif is to sort of just take something that generally would be thought of as the absolute opposite of Ayn Rand and just to kind of pull you out of what I feel is this identity core circle that I felt you had to accept. Uh, you know, you read Ayn Rand, you're kind of this person, and then you like her, and then you're kind of this person, and all of a sudden there's all this baggage associated with it. Whereas uh, that's not necessarily the case with like Faulkner or Tolkien or Star Wars, you know? Uh, and Star Wars is enormously, is, is enormously successful and influential, uh, it, you know, I, I would say, on, on how people see themselves. Uh, and, uh, and so to a certain extent, uh, I kind of feel like it would be great if that's uh, that's broken a little bit. And the way you read Ayn Rand uh, and then decide to craft your own life or, or handle a decision about people coming and hanging out in your joint, uh, you know, uh, is uh, is sort of your affair. 
And because uh, ultimately you as the individual are the decider of like what is your value tree and what's a higher or a lesser. Uh, you know, we shouldn't be going to the board to, to work it out in math. Um, you know, ideally it should be something that you, uh, you know, that you're internalizing and becoming and you're, the greatest thing that you can discover is your own identity because uh, you're in a discovery process in life or as a creator. And so you're always doing stuff and reflecting on it and getting a better understanding of yourself. And so Ayn Rand's novels give you like a, a pathway identity that you can sort of reflect upon those characters. And then the philosophy gives you a mechanism to, to sort of order the thinking and reflect and think about it. Uh, you know, I, I sort of look at it as like the eyes and the ears. They're two means of observing the world. Uh, there's the personal I that's me, and then there is, you know, I can project myself as a human being, another, a third person perspective. And, and so I, I sort of have these two ways of experience in the world. And uh, so I, I don't really think that we should worry about reducing one or another. Uh, and I think that, that for me, it would be great to see other writers like Ayn Rand take up these themes and these ideas without sort of feeling any sort of obligation, like I felt as a young writer, to kind of be in a school, but rather to, you know, read it, be inspired, waken the ideas in yourself, and then go create something that is, you know, totally far out there.